All right, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar discussion on Zionism and Palestine. Um, please feel free to tell us who you are and where you're joining us from in the chat box. Um, my name is Alicia Rinkowska, and I'm the development coordinator at Christian Peacemaker Teams and former Palestine team member joining you from Chicago. I'm just going to go ahead and share some information about our website. I'll do that right now. Um, hopefully you can see that. <clears throat> Okay, so oops. so just a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, so we can't see or hear you. So if you have any questions or discussion, um, please just type them into the Q&A box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen for most of you. Um, we will also dedicate um, a period of this webinar to questions. So we'll get to those at the end. Um, and since there are about 200 of us um, on this webinar, we might not get through all of them, but we're going to try our best. Um, so you can reach out by going to our website at cpt.org if you do cpt.org if you do have any questions um, that you want to send us after this event. And you will also be able to find a recorded version of this webinar there as well. Okay, so that information should be on that slide. Okay. Okay, so just a little bit of background before we get started. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, um, Christian Peace Baker Teams or CPT is an organization that trains everyday people to work in local peacemaking communities that are confronting situations of lethal conflict, partnering with them to transform violence and oppression. Um, we also need delegations to our various program sites so that others can be involved with the communities that we partner with. And we have teams in Colombia, Iraqi Kurdistan, Lesbos, Greece, the Mexico borderlands, and Palestine, which will be the central part of our discussion today. And you can find out more about CBT and the delegations, again, at our website, cpt.org. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about Amy and Linda, who are our presenters for tonight. Um, so um, Amy is the pastor at Fraser and Mennonite Church in Pennsylvania, and she serves on the CPT steering committee. And since 2015, Amy has been leading multi-faith delegations to Palestine with CPT. And Rabbi Linda is the organizer of Tikkun Alam Shavua, a group that pursues social justice work together as a community. She's on the faculty of the Recreationist Rabbinical College and serves on the board of directors for Jewish Voices for Peace. Amy and Rabbi Linda have traveled together to Palestine twice and will be discussing through their experiences there how they see Zionism impacting the Palestinian community. So once again, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom and over to you, Amy and Linda. All right. All right, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Yeah. And um, we, you know, a Amy and I met um, through doing work in Philadelphia, through doing work, doing different kinds of social political justice work. Um, I got to stand by and support Amy when she was um, arrested uh, to support immigrant rights. Um, we got to be there for each other in many different, many different capacities throughout the past several years. Um, but I think we really connected at a Jewish event, a holiday called Shavuot, which means weeks, and um, it is the, the day when we commemorate the revelation of the, the Torah, the five books of Moses um, on Mount Sinai. And um, we both shared among many people there that night, Christians, Jews, Muslims, um, shared our theologies and our take on, on revelation. And at the end of the night, we looked at each other and said, huh, aren't we remarkably similar? <laughs> And we got to be friends from there. Um, I think it was probably before that, though, Linda. Okay. Um, so we we were we have traveled in similar circles with um, neighborhood interfaith movement in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. New Sanctuary movement, uh, and also an organization called Heeding God's Call. And my first memory of you is with Heeding God's Call, which is an organization that tries to eliminate illegal gun sales in um, in Philadelphia. And uh, she, Linda was preaching at an Interfaith Good Friday service. So just to take a moment to wrap your head around that uh, and was preaching on Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's still one of the best Good Friday sermons I've ever heard. 
And uh, I was speaking there uh, and we had counter protesters that had hired an ice cream truck um, that was playing very loudly behind us. So I was trying to give a prayer of invocation while we heard the... Uh, <laughs> and we held up and, and did it and continued to work together and had the real joy of traveling twice to the West Bank together. I, I um, loved being um, part of an interfaith group that, um, that, that Amy was leading and that we, we worked on together in planning and in doing and it. it, it's been really wonderful. Um, one of the things we have talked about together is Zionism and trying to, um, for me now, it's about building a Judaism that goes beyond Zionism and what that can mean because the Judaism that I knew is very focused on Zionism. Um, in general, Zionism is a complicated concept, right? But what it really means to a lot of people, probably to most people, is that the land of Israel and the Jewish people have a special relationship. And how that relationship is expressed um, is seen as different um, from different people. There are some who see it as just a deep spiritual religious connection that has nothing to do with statehood or politics. There are some who say, no, it's really a cultural connection and really see that Jews are culturally joined together there in the land of Israel in a way that they are um, not elsewhere. Um, there are many who see that the primary focus is history. And the fact that Jewish history can be traced back to uh, mythic times to a special connection with the land in Israel. Um, but Zionism almost always talks about the special link between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And since 1948, the founding of the state of Israel, the po most powerful aspect of Zionism that's being expressed is the political Zionism, is the state of Israel that not all Jews, but lots of Jews support. Uh, Christian Zionism is um, a little different spin. Um, so Christian Zionism is that idea that um, that Christians need to help the Jews return to the Holy Land uh, in, so that uh, prophecy will be fulfilled. Um, there are, there's a kind of apocalyptic Christian theology uh, in, fundament, in fundamentalism that sees um, all the Jews returning to Israel will bring on the second coming of Christ. And so our job as Christians is to make that happen. When I was growing up, I certainly knew nothing about that. <laughs> but what I did know a lot about was that I, I was born in 1952, I'm old, and, um, and that was seven years after the Holocaust ended and uh, it was four years after the founding of the state of israel and my family and my community taught me that um israel and the modern state of israel was the one possible safe place for the jewish people and look hadn't we just learned that the jewish people were endangered easily and needed a state in israel we didn't learn about the colonial project of um, of Zionism, which was very real and had been actively involved for by then oh, 70 or 80 years. Um, we didn't learn that um, Israel really was a political force um, that was not there just for the safety of the Jewish people, but was there as a form of supremacy of, for the Jewish people who largely came from Eastern Europe and who wanted to come in and really take over a land that otherwise had been inhabited and, um, and lived in for many years by Palestinians and also by Jews who were from North Africa and often from the area around Spain, Sephardic Jews and, and what are called Mizrahi Jews. So the, um, the, the land for me as I was growing up was the center. And the most important thing that I was taught anyone could do was to go to Israel, was to plant trees in Israel through the Jewish National Fund, was to um, donate money to Israel. Um, in my synagogue, when the Yom Kippur War um, uh, occurred in 1973, I was sitting in the synagogue on Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day of the uh, Jewish calendar. 
and we were learning that the land of Israel was at war and was being attacked. And one by one, people were jumping up in my synagogue saying, I'll go, I want to fight, I want to defend Israel. And for me, I, I wasn't ready to do that, but it felt like the most important thing that I could possibly do because the land of Israel meant so much. Um, I grew up in Christian fundamentalism. Um, I'm a Mennonite pastor now, but I've... Uh have taken quite a theological journey. Uh, if you've ever seen the documentary uh, For the Bible Tells Me So, uh, that's based on uh, a John Hagee group, uh, Christians United for Israel, uh, which is uh, one of the most par powerful uh, pro-Israel um, lobby lobbying groups in the country. Um, that's kind of the world I grew up in. Uh, it wasn't so rah-rah Israel like in your face, but we really had the sense that it was our duty as Christians to help the Jews get to the Holy Land. Um, not because we cared about the Jews, to be honest, because um, we didn't. Uh, the Christianity I grew up in really saw Christians as um, the best, the coolest, the most important. Um, but we were going to help those poor Jews get to Israel because then Jesus will come back for us and screw everybody else. Um, so that's that's <coughs> the world that I grew up in, and, and that's how I saw Christian Zionism uh, mm -hmm. playing out in my community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first time I went to Israel, I was in high school. It was 1969, um, so it was the year after the 67 war, and the year after West um, East Jerusalem was occupied, and um, lots of the West Bank was occupied, and we toured with absolutely no understanding that there had been people who were living there, that the fields that we were told, you know, Israel was, the Israelis were making the desert bloom. Um, we hadn't realized that anything had been blooming before they got there, that anything was being raised, that there were olive trees even before the um, Israelis came. Um, when we were touring, we would see tanks by the side of the road that were still there from the war two years earlier, and they were there for us to look at and see as extraordinary. Wasn't it wonderful that this was happening because this represented safety for the Jewish people? And the truth is that my parents' generation, and even to some extent, a lot of my generation felt real fear and felt as if we absolutely needed to be kept safe. And we could close our eyes to the fact that there were Palestinians there before we got there um, and just act as if it was just ours to take. <clears throat> I, um, it took me a long time to realize that uh, that in fact was not the case that there had been Palestinians living on the land um, in Israel, Palestine uh, for uh, consistently for a very long time, um, for much more consistently than, than the Jewish population living there. Um, and I started to realize it as an adult. I, I finished college not paying a lot of attention and then um, joined a, a group at some point called New Jewish Agenda, which was seen as sort of the radical group in the Jewish world, uh, because one of the things we did was say there, we had to pay attention to the fact that there were Palestinians and that the Palestinians deserved some kind of rights. Um, I, through the years, I always thought so, but there, it was always sort of secondary to me. Like Israel was still so important. And before anyone could say anything in the Jewish community about wanting to support Palestinian rights, one first had to talk about how deeply one loved Israel. So I remember very clearly when I was running a, a religious school in Philadelphia at a synagogue called Mishkan Shalom that I, I later served as rabbi for a while, um, and that we decided that our religious school would march in the Israeli Independence Day parade. And we went out and we marched and we decided that we would have a float that was a peace float. And there was an Israeli flag and there was a Palestinian flag and there were kids who were dressed up as 
um, in, in colors that we saw as quintessentially Israeli and quintessentially Palestinian. And we were singing a song that, that Od Yavo Shalom Aleinu, may there be peace upon us and upon all of Israel and all Palestine. And we were very proud of ourselves and very happy because we thought, good, we can give this message within the Jewish people. That day, as we walked in our float, the then rabbi of the synagogue was walking alongside of us, feeling pretty good about what we were doing. Um, and one by one, there were members of the Jewish community who were threatening him, who were saying that he didn't deserve to be there, who were saying that our float was a disgrace, and how could we stand up and have that kind of message? I think that it was at that moment for me that I started to realize, you know, there's something going on here that is beyond just um, there are Israelis who um, are uh, standing up for their own needs and how important that is. And of course, Palestinian have right, Palestinians have rights, but that's second in importance. Starting to realize that, that the state of Israel was stepping on an entire people. And if they were doing that and stepping on a people that had absolute rights to the land, that there was something seriously wrong with that state. Now that was, a, that was in the 1990s. And it took me quite a while to, till I reached a point where I was ready to say, I, I really can't define myself as a Zionist any longer. Um, but that was for me a start. So we want to talk this evening a little bit about how we've seen Zionism connect uh, to our experiences of traveling in Palestine. Uh, and so Linda and I are just going to share some stories. Um, we, we do our best work telling stories. Uh, and uh, and I, I, hope, I hope the stories that we share uh, reflect some of what we've, what we've seen uh, in Palestine and the way that Zionism has impacted the land. Um, I want to tell a story about 2017. Uh, I was traveling from uh, the airport in Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Um, I usually took one of those little shuttle buses to save some money, but I was in a hurry, so I jumped in a cab. I think it was with you, and I think this was with you. Um, so, uh, and I, oh, told, yeah, yeah, I told the cab driver, uh, please take us to the <laughs> Damascus Gate in Jerusalem, which, if you know anything about Israel and Palestine, uh, Damascus Gate, everybody knows this place. So he put it in his GPS and uh, he couldn't find it. He put it in again, couldn't find it. I pulled out my phone, couldn't find it. Um, I gave him the name of a hotel nearby, we couldn't find it. It was like we were in some weird twilight zone. So finally he called his dispatcher, he figured out where, where he was going and, um, and we got there. But it didn't occur to us until we were at uh, a presentation a couple days later that what was actually happening was that uh, Palestinians were erased from the map, mm -hmm. literally erased from the map. So if you were um, traveling to Palestinian territory from Tel Aviv uh, and you didn't know where you were going, well, good luck. Um, this, the, the map, the Google Maps and uh, Waze and any other GPS system that you use at your home um, is used in Israel and they only use Israeli, um, is, it, the Israeli <laughs> um, map system there. So uh, if, you're a if you're a Palestinian, you do not exist in the mapping system. Um, if you live in the West Bank, um, for, so for example, if you went and Googled Hebron, you would not see most of the streets that Linda and I have walked on and traveled on um, because it doesn't matter to Israel that that's uh, Palestinian territory. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody really needs to know that. Um, and, and to me, that was one of those places where we saw uh, an erasure of people through technology and through mapping. Um, there's an organization in Jerusalem called uh, Grassroots Jerusalem that is trying to um, combat that uh, by uh, doing grassroot map creating uh, in East Jerusalem. So they're uh, talking to people on the ground in Palestinian communities and having them create their own maps uh, so that they know where they are in the larger maps. Mm -hmm. um, they've also created, I, for lack of a better term, what we've kind of called the Palestinian Green Book. So um, how Palestinians can get around 
um, in their own systems, how they can connect with each other, places to eat, places to stay, um, you know, places that will accommodate Palestinians um, and where they will be safe and comfortable. Um, but that is an underground movement that had to happen because <coughs> the official maps uh, do not recognize Palestinians. The other thing that I never saw from official maps, but saw with grassroots Jerusalem, is that when you, um, you, you start to realize just how deliberate this um, invisibilizing of Palestinians is and um, taking away the power of Palestinians whenever possible is. Um, at one point with Grassroots Jerusalem, we stood on a hill in Jerusalem and looked out over what had been a rather large Palestinian village. And we noticed that in the middle of the village is a very large forest. And it seems strange that there's a large forest dividing this village in two until you realize that the forest was planted by the Jewish National Fund for the State of Israel in order to divide the village into two so that it would eliminate any opportunity for this village to really stand up and claim any real power. And we saw over and over again the way that the ground can be used and the way that maps can be used to really make a difference. I wanted to, to share, Amy, as you're, as you're talking, um, it struck me that taxi rides are a way to learn an awful lot about what's going on and that getting to that hostel in the old city of Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, can be really challenging. Um, and that one night we went to, our group went to, uh, it was a Friday night, and we went to a Jewish Sabbath service in West Jerusalem. And about three of us got into a taxi. And I told the taxi driver that we were staying in the old city in East Jerusalem um, and that we were staying near the Damascus Gate. And I was, uh, he, he looked at me um, as if, you know, what, what are you talking about? Um, what do you mean you're staying near the Damascus Gate? And I said, that's where we're staying. And I was speaking to him in Hebrew, and he was talking to me in Hebrew. I knew we understood each other, but he said, no, no, what's your hotel called? And I told him, and I told him where it was, and he looked it up, and as Amy pointed out, he couldn't find it. And he said, no, I'm sorry, you know, that's, that can't be where you're staying. And I said, it, it, in fact, it can be where we're staying. And we just left there a couple hours ago and I'd like a ride back there. Please leave us at the Damascus Gate. And he tried everything that he could all the way back to stop us from going there. And at some point he turned around and he looked at me and he said, did you hear about the murder? And there had been a murder of a, a child from a settlement that it was thought that there were Palest there was Palestinian um, uh, perpetrator, and there very possibly was. It was quite a bit north of Jerusalem, was nowhere near Jerusalem. And I said, we did. And he said, don't you see? That's what they do. And I said, I'm sorry. That is what someone did. And I believe that that was in response to many, many, many different things. And I don't know what happened at that one particular event, but we are completely safe in our hotel near the Damascus Gate. And he led us off, and I had been wearing a kippah, skull cap it's called, where, um, which made me identifiably Jewish. And he said, take that off. And he wouldn't let me out of the car until I took it off, and I took that off, and I said, okay, it's off. And he said, I, I hope you're safe. And he never believed that we would be okay. Mm. One of the other ways that I think uh, Palestinians can get erased from the story is actually uh, in the most well-meaning of ways uh, where folks uh, from both sides, um, I hate that language, but I'm going to use it here for lack of other language, uh, where folks from both sides try to um, learn to see the humanity in each other. It sounds like such a heartwarming moment, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. We're all one. Uh, but there's a group in uh, the West Bank uh, called Roots, and it's run by uh, Israelis, uh, Israeli settlers, and uh, Palestinians living in the West Bank. And their goal, their aim, is to try to see the humanity in each other. 
And for a couple of years when I led delegations, I would go to Roots. I have since stopped going. It's just gotten to be uh, too difficult. Uh, but what they do is they, they bring groups in and they talk about all the ways that they're coming together and, and, uh, and really breaking down barriers and getting to know each other. But the truth of the matter is when these uh, folks leave this little enclave at Roots, um, the settlers go back to their settlements and live uh, surrounded by security and walls and Palestinians go home and um, their homes are raided by, by um, Israeli occupying forces. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't change for um, the settlers where they live. It doesn't call into question um, their theology, their rights to the land, um, or even what's happening to the Palestinians. Um, but they can feel good for a moment because they have all joined hands and sung We Are the World Together, uh, and they, they somehow feel better about that. Um, but this is another way I think that, um, that Palestinians are, re are uh, erased, uh, because in this attempt for, um, for uh, settlers to, to see the humanity, um, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't change, it doesn't change them. Um, they have a warm, fuzzy moment, and then things go right back to where they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw the erasure too in a very deliberate way. I think the most powerful places, among the most powerful places um, I've ever been has been um, the city of Hebron and the, the old city where we stayed when we were there. And um, one of the first things you notice about Hebron is that the settlement of Kiryat Arba, an Israeli settlement, is high on a hill near, right near Hebron. And there's a giant sign above the city that says, Kiryat, in Hebrew, Kiryat Arba hi Hebron, which is Kiryat Arba is Hebron. Now, that's actually a quote from, from the book of Genesis, um, and it's taken out of context. And in Genesis, it means, let me help you understand what, where this city is. Here, it means to say very clearly, you want to understand what Hebron is? It's not that city of Palestinians. It is, in fact, this settlement, Kiryat Arba. So the first night that we were there, the first time I went to Hebron, um, we were, it was a Friday night, which was the Jewish Sabbath, and we were going to sleep, and I couldn't sleep until three in the morning because of the amount of noise. There were drums, there was singing, there was music, it sounded as if there was dancing. Um, it was very loud and very lively, and I thought, wow. Do the Palestinians here celebrate every night? What's going on? This is really weird. And the next morning I said to Amy, so what is all of this? Like, what's going on? And she was really very clear. She said, no, that's not the Palestinians making that noise. That is the Israeli soldiers who have permission and in fact are told to make that kind of noise when they can on the Jewish Sabbath so that they make sure they let the town of, Heb of Hebron know who's in power and who has the right to celebrate and who has the right to keep them up until three in the morning just because they want to. And I was horrified. It, it, you know, Hebrew to me is the holy, holy language. It's the language that, that um, the, the Hebrew Bible, the Bible that I use is written in. It's the language that most of the traditional texts that I study are written in. It's the language that Jewish prayer is written in. And for me, it's always been the sacred language and learning Hebrew has always been wonderful for me. And by the end of being there, I almost couldn't hear Hebrew words without feeling a deep sense of shame. I think there are ways that um that Christian, if you're Christian or Jewish, that this, this Zionism has, has kind of uh, infected our theology. Uh, and one of the th things that, that has been clear to Linda and I on these trips is that um, if, the th if our theology 
uh, I'll speak for me as a Christian. Uh, if my theology as a Christian is not focused on love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, then it is not serving me well. Hmm. And so um, I, I recognize every time I'm in Palestine, the ways that um, Christian Zionism it has tentacles that are just deep, deep, deep in my theology. And, and every year I have to spend some time uh, reflecting on that and trying to, um, to pull my, my theology out of that thing that I was raised in mm -hmm. um, and, to, and to expand it um, mm -hmm. and fill it with grace. Yeah, um, and, and for me, you know, we, we read the um, Jewish um, worship service on Saturday mornings is centered around a reading of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. We call it the Torah, and that's considered the most sacred of our books. And it starts with the creation of the world, and it ends with the arrival at the promised land. And there are people who see it as um, a, a model that we need to follow, that we need to get to the promised land, the land of Israel, and that we need to claim it as our own because in over the course of those books, we are told over and over again that God gave that land to us, to the followers of, of that God, to the, um, the Jewish people. Uh, there's some problems with that. You know, one very major problem is that when we look at all of those books as absolute history and as something that we're supposed to follow and as laws that we're supposed to follow so that we are ready to take over in that land, we're misunderstanding, I think, and we're misreading mm -hmm. that those books are myth and that we need, in my mind, to understand those books as very powerful myth and that they can help us see who we are as a people and see who we are as a people in our strength and also in our weaknesses and our challenges. The fact that those are the myths that we are based on doesn't mean that those myths tell us exactly what we need to do and what we need to follow in our lives. They sometimes tell us what we need to wrestle with and what we need to struggle with because those myths will often talk about what are our most powerful impulses. And we understand that they're true and they're real. But the fact that those are our absolutely strongest impulses doesn't mean that that's where we need to go. So an example is when, the, uh, when Moses leads the ancient um, uh, people of Israel to the land, um, he sends scouts into the land, and the command is that they should see if they'd be strong enough so that they could conquer all of the people in the land and take over. So that is a pretty strong impulse, right? Like you get to a place where you feel insecure and you're in like ancient times, you take over. You want to know that you have that kind of strength. But what we need to realize is if we are people who, um, who look at other people and see only, are we strong enough so that we can take over and we can rule, that's seriously problematic. And we need to challenge ourselves to see other people really differently. So using those ancient texts to struggle with them and to learn and to learn about ourselves, that's really important. To follow the image, to follow exactly the model of what it gives verbatim leads us to a problematic place. Because at the end of that Torah, we get to the book of Joshua and we know that that's a war story. That was the ancient Israelites going in, taking over, um, marching around and uh, uh, t tearing down the walls of Jericho um, and lots of other cities because that's what they had learned. Uh, I think another book that is a great example of that is the book of Judges, uh, where things are just um, mm -hmm. just terrible story after terrible story. Uh, some of the worst stories for women in the entire Bible happen in the book of Judges. And the refrain um, is always, and the people did what was right in their own mind. So it's another example of those, those stories that are not there to teach us how to do the right thing, but more as a, a warning of like, this is what happens when people do what is right in their own mind mm -hmm. uh, and, aren't following, um, and aren't following God. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I, there, there, there are so many issues um, that, 
we can barely hit them all. Mm -hmm. But but there's one just very major one that I want to I want to pause at for a moment, and that is the question of, of anti-Semitism. Um, that for me as a rabbi to say everything that I've been saying could get me in trouble with lots of the Jewish world. And the reason, and I, I can be called a self-hating Jew, which I have been called, and I've been called anti-Semitic. And um, I've actually spent my entire life working for the Jewish people and have a deep love of the Jewish people. And when I look at the state of Israel, I see a state that was built um, out of people's fear and out of insecurity and um, really a state that was built by a people who were in post-traumatic stress, that it, it's a people who felt deeply anti-Semitism um, and wanted to counter it in every way that they could. Um, but if you don't really um, work on the your experience of trauma and come to understand it and reach a place of greater health, you're just going to keep re-traumatizing and re-traumatizing and re-traumatizing other people. The second piece around anti-Semitism that I find incredibly challenging and difficult is that there is real anti-Semitism in our world. We see it right now in our country um, and we see it in the world and it's scary and it's dangerous and there's no question about it. And my saying, I see myself as anti-Zionist is very different from being anti-Semitic. And there's a lot of conflation of the two of saying, ah, if you're anti-Zionist, you must also be anti-Semitic. That's what it means um, when, in fact, it doesn't at all. I want to leave you with one last story, maybe two, but maybe just one for now. <laughs> um, the, uh, in 2018, I was leading my delegation, and on the first day, I got lost, <laughs> like a good delegation leader. Um, and me and 12 delegates uh, were lost in the Anata refugee camp. And we were looking for help, and I, my uh, Arabic is terrible. And we finally uh, found someone that uh, could help us, and he brought us to his home. He didn't speak any English. He was bringing us to his daughter, um, me and 12 people, strangers, coming to his home. And uh, if this happened in the United States, this would be the beginning of a horror movie. Uh, but we were in Palestine, and uh, they brought us into their home. They gave us tea and coffee and grapefruit juice and um, baklava and sweets. And then uh, the daughter came in, her name is Islam, and uh, she greeted us and told us uh, that we were definitely in the wrong place and helped us to get a van uh, so that we could get to where we were going. Uh, but before she let us leave, she made us promise that we would come back the next night and have dinner. And this family cooked for us this incredible meal, mokluba, baklava, uh, stuffed grape leaves, chicken. Um, they had hookah for the grown-ups. The kids played soccer. We were there until late in the night. Um, and that was uh, just such classic Palestinian hospitality. Um, we had such a great time. They've uh, become friends. I talk with Islam on uh, social media all the time. So last summer I brought Linda with me and after being there for several hours, Linda finally leaned over and said, should I tell them I'm a rabbi? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I said, oh, go for it. So they did and um, she did. And, and the family was so surprised and so delighted that um, you know a rabbi was in their home and a rabbi cared about Palestinians. Um, and it was such a moment of breaking down barriers. Um, it was another one of those moments that reminded me that if my theology was not made for a moment like this, then what am I even doing? Um, our theology, uh, for me as a Christian, my theology is all about uh, Jesus breaking down barriers um, and Jesus teaching us how to love. And uh, this was a moment where I love was, and grace was extended to me. Um, and I did not deserve it. And um, it, it, was, it was a moment of, of expansive grace for me. Um, these are folks that now that I have to visit every year. They're, um, they're part of my life um, and they feel like family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other, the other, I mean, very, it was a wonderful night actually. And, um, and I was so honored to be a part of 
what was an extraordinary dinner. I mean, yes. they really just like, oh, you're here now. We'll start cooking. <laughs> and it just, it just did. Um, the other, I, 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 one last piece before we go to questions, and that is that this being the, being on the West Bank opened up people for me and organizations doing extraordinary work for me that we may hear their names when we're here in the United States or in Canada, but we, we don't get it until we see them. Um, so uh, you said that Hamed is, is actually here on the, on the webinar. Hi, Hamed. Um, the, the Hebron International Resource Network was started by an extraordinary, extraordinary man um, named Hamed who came to the United States, who came to Philadelphia to meet with us, um, who invited us to come to lunch that his mother prepared for us the last time we were there on the West Bank. Um, I mean, just there are wonderful people doing terrific work. And the work that Hamid is doing is work to just stand up and say, oh, the people in Hebron now need a girls school. Sure, we'll build one. Oh, the people in this village don't have a playground. Sure, we'll build one. Oh, the people here are really desperate because they need solar panels on their homes because they can't um, keep them cool or warm um, or get electricity as they need it. Sure, we'll get them. And it doesn't mean that, that the things that um, he and his community build are not dismantled 30 times sometimes or that he has to keep redoing and redoing and redoing, but he is so determined. Um, that he just keeps building and doing anything that is needed. And you might see that as just an act of kindness, but in my mind, it's also an act of the strongest political justice that I can imagine, of standing up and saying, whatever the state says, let it stay. I'm going to make sure that people's needs are met. Yeah. Alicia, we're going to turn it over to you for Q&A. Wonderful. We've got a, quite a few questions here. So, <clears throat> and if we don't get your questions, um, be sure that we will be sending them on. So Amy and Linda will receive them. Actually. So we've got our first question um, from Jim. He says, you reference colonialism. I'm interested in your thoughts about the connections between Zionism and colonialism. Also, what do you think might be the racial dimensions involved, especially in Christian Zionism? <laughs> okay, that we, very, I, I'm going to just give a, a, a five second answer to a question that deserves a very long answer, and then you can talk about Christian Zionism. Okay. Okay. Um, my, my five second answer is just that, um, that Israel wasn't just born magically in 1948. It was clearly a colonialist project of, um, of uh, many Jews. Um, in, in Europe following in the model of Britain, that Britain was very tied up with the early days of, of, um, of Israel-Palestine, and um, that um, that's, that would be worth an, a webinar, actually, to really talk about, about the ties, uh, because it's so clear that um, Israel is there as a face of empire and that it's standing up and speaking um, in the name of the larger powers that surround it, as is clear by the amount of money the United States gives to Israel now, that um, Israel is not just a poor little country surrounded by enemies. Israel is by now the wealthiest country imaginable as far as weaponry goes and as far as military strength goes. And that's all out of the, the colonialist tradition in which it, it comes and that the United States buys into really clearly. All right, the other part of the question was about the racial components of oh. Christian Zionism. Um, I, so I have family that are still uh, supportive of Christians United for Israel. And um, I'm a little ornery. I like, to, I like to make them mad at Christmas. So I buy them uh, Koresh scenes from Palestine that say made by the Palestinian people, um, which really uh, makes them mad. But uh, my, my family, when, I, when they receive these gifts, are shocked that there are Palestinians who are um, also Christians and that there are Palestinians who are not terrorists because um, their understanding is that um, first, got to get the Jews to the Holy Land, and second of all, the people that are there are all terrorists. 
Um, and if you see any uh, TV story or TV <laughs> shows about Palestinians, it's always Palestinians and Hamas, Palestinians and ISIS, which isn't even a thing. And, um, you know, Palestinian equals terrorist. So the, um, the messages that, um, that we get play into that Christian Zionism of Christians are best, uh, got to help the Jews, uh, Palestinians are definitely terrorists. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, kind of doing in order, but this is a little bit of a long one, but I think it's important because I think a lot of people have, have had similar questions. Um, so this is from Ben. Um, he says, your stories are reigniting emotions I experienced whilst visiting Israel-Palestine with MCC last year. My question is around Christian theology, particularly Palestinian liberation theology and the witness of Palestinian Christians through things like the Kairos document and calling for BDS, which is boycott, divestment and sanctions. I've seen several liberal minded Jewish scholars and leaders of Christian Jewish understanding organizations who I respect and have learned from call these things anti-Semitic or too radical and instead say we should focus on ways that Jews and Palestinians are working together. In my limited understanding, I don't agree with their views on this, but I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on this because I don't want to promote anything that promote negative views of the Jewish community. Hmm. Um, I'm a strong supporter of BDS right now because um, whatever we understand of Palestinian civil society has um, called upon all of us to boycott and divest and sanction. And um, I want to follow the lead of the Palestinian people because that is the moral thing to do. Um, that um, boycott, while it's often referred to as anti-Semitic, I've heard it referred to as violent, is not violent. Um, we boycotted grapes um, in the 1960s um, because the, um, the grape workers were not getting fair treatment and that turned that treatment around. Um, that's the idea. The idea is not that we say, Israel, you are evil forever and there is no way out. It's we will boycott what you are do you now while what you are doing is immoral and is wrong. Um, if what you're claiming is that a Jewish state has superiority and has rights that um, Palestinian people don't have, that is immoral and we need to make as strong a statement as possible and boycott, divest, sanction is in my mind as strong a, a statement as possible. So I don't see that at all as anti-Semitic and I know that there are people who say that it is because I think it scares them a little bit um, because it can have power. It had power in South Africa around apartheid and it might very well have power now. Um, and for me, at least, I want it to have power. I want the state of Israel to be forced to look at what it's doing and to change the way it moves into the future. I don't want the people of Israel destroyed. I want them to change. Um, ben, I want to thank you for this question. Uh, I, I think that um, some of the most powerful transformative theology that I've been reading is Palestinian liberation the theology. Uh, Linda and I read uh, Mitri Raheb's book, Faith in the Face of Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a Palestinian uh, from uh, Bethlehem. And that book was transformative uh, because it is Palestinians saying, um, we know a little bit about Jesus. He was one of us. And so let's tell you, we want to tell you a little bit about Jesus and Jesus's relationship to the land and um, and, and what the land means in the text. And, you know, th there's just so many layers there. Um, hearing people talk about uh, their story and the land that they live on, they've lived on for centuries, uh, and their perspective of the Bible from those experiences uh, is not anti-Semitic. It's, 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 it's a contextual experiential theology and we don't have issues with well I don't have issues with it with it when um, James Cone talks about the cross and the lynching tree and um, so I don't I'm not really sure why someone would consider that anti-semitic mm -hmm. thank you um, okay we've got quite a few questions asking about um, wanting to know the, the exact difference between anti-zionism and anti-semitism can you explain more on that yeah. Um, uh, Anti-Semitism is anybody who 
is um, working against uh, the Jewish people is um, finding often it, it's expressed in a lot of different ways. It might be hatred of the Jewish people, fear of the Jewish people, um, creating negative myths about the Jewish people, seeing the Jewish people as dangerous in some way. Um, it's all directed toward Jews and toward the Jewish people, and it's been around, unfortunately, for as long as there have been Jews, it seems. Um, Anti-Zionism is saying, I don't believe that the Jews have um, the right to a land that is just solely theirs and is sacred only to them. And that the current state of Israel needs to be challenged because it sees um, the land as a Jewish state. And at least for me, I don't believe that one can be um, both um, supportive of a, de a democracy and um, a, a state that, is, that, that favors one religious group over any other. That, that makes it not a democracy. It makes it um, unfair. It makes it um, unequal for all of the people in the land. So I, I see them as very different. And I can strongly say I'm not anti-Semitic. And I am not supportive of Zionism. Thanks, Linda. Okay, we've got another bit of a longer one, but again, I think it's going to resonate with some people. Um, so Curtis Bell asks, um, some Israeli Jews and Palestinians have formed a movement for one democratic state as a political goal that those of us working Palestinian rights should support. Israeli oppression is multifaceted and widespread. We who support Palestinians are always rea um, reacting here and there to one separate oppressive act or another, playing whack-a-mole. Perhaps we need to get behind the movement for one democratic state. This would resonate with people in the US and all over the world. What do you think? I'm gonna let you answer that one. <laughs> no, I, you, I, I don't know, maybe we think the same thing. I mean, what I think is that, um, you know, back in the in the 80s and 90s, some of us supported a two-state solution because we, we believed it was possible and that there could be a Jewish state and a Palestinian state that live near each other. And what we've watched since then is the state of Israel make it impossible um, for that to happen, like taking that village I talked about at the beginning, the Palestinian village and putting a forest in the middle. What they've done is put settlements down everywhere that there might possibly wind up being enough contiguous land of Palestinians for there to be a Palestinian state. So right now, that's an impossibility. So is a one state solution a possibility? Can that actually happen? I, I don't know, but it might be able to. And um, when I look into the future, I don't have a clue as to what can actually work, but I do see um, some possibility of, um, of Israeli Jews and Palestinians figuring out how the land does not just belong to one of them, but belongs to both of them. And exactly how that can happen, whether it's one big democratic state or something somewhat different, I don't know. But um, I hope, I hope it's either something like that or some, it is something sort of like that, that maybe a, a state that is, has different kinds of governments that, that um, work in different sections of the state, or who knows, I don't think we have the exact solution yet, but I think that's one definite step towards a vision for something that might work. And, and I feel like uh, <laughs> things are such a mess right now, I, I don't even know. I don't even know like what is possible. So my goal has just been to elevate Palestinian voices as much as possible, yeah. um, to respond to the needs on the ground um, that I that I hear, and um, to be uh, to to make sure that these voices are getting out there. Um, uh, one state, two state, no state. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. That's why Jewish Voice for Peace, that I'm very involved in, doesn't say this is exactly what we think um, the government should be in the future. It's just how do we stand up right now and help the United States realize that by giving $3 billion plus every single year to the Israeli government to use for the military is um, only strengthening the kind of state that doesn't work and that is destroying the lives of Palestinians and I think is soul killing for Israelis as well. 
Okay, we've got a question from Martin. Um, ideas on how to fight the IHRAs, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's new working definition of anti-Semitism. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just keep having conversations with people about it. Um, when, I mean, the first question you get asked when you're doing work around a Palestine is, well, this is anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I point out um, that uh, we can criticize our country and that is, well, I consider that a patriotic responsibility, um, but doing that in the state of Israel is considered anti-Semitic. And um, how, how, how then, like what is the what is the check and balance for Israel um, if it's not it's if it's not people saying hey wait a minute uh, this isn't right I don't yeah know if you have a different answer no that. exactly that answer yeah <laughs> okay yep. okay we've got a question um, how can we challenge the deal of the century which is the I guess the new peace plan especially yeah. with Trump's presidency it's hard. I mean, with Trump as in the in the um, presidency, it winds up being extremely hard. And I think, um, you know, look at the Jewish Voice for Peace website because what we try to do is um, change what happens here, um, make it clear that the entire Jewish community. When you say that the entire Jewish community supports the state of Israel, therefore we need to do it. And if we don't support it, there we're anti-Semitic. You can see on the the JVP website that that's not true and that the um, entire Jewish community does not back the state of Israel. Um, it's important, I think, as people who are religious people, whatever your, your church is, um, that uh, we keep standing up and saying that in the name of our faith, we believe that what's happening in Israel is unacceptable and is not okay. And that this deal of the century is not a deal at all. That talking about annexing territory, the, the um, government of Israel annexing territory that doesn't belong to them and that should not belong to them is a disgrace and uh, um, is wrong and needs to be challenged constantly. Um, and I think it's doing things like what Amy and I are doing. I think go out and make many, many webinars and keep telling the stories and keep standing up and speaking out because the more that it's honest and open and clear, um, the more likely that people will see the holes in this deal and in the Trump presidency's ideas of what should happen in Israel-Palestine. Um, I, I told you about the Issa family. Um, the night uh, that the deal of the century was announced, yeah. um, I talked to Islam um, over the phone and uh, she was freaking out. Uh, her car had been shot at. I, I still am not sure what that was about. I think it may have been at a checkpoint. Um, and she was concerned that this was the end of the world as she knew it. So if you are talking to Palestinians on the ground, they are terrified. Um, and she is, this is not a, a political Palestinian family. This is just like you know, a girl in her 20s um, who just wants to like live her life um, and hang out with her friends uh, and do what any other 20 something wants to do. Um, and she is terrified. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't, if that doesn't worry you, <laughs> it worries me. Um, and, and those are the things that, that keep me fighting uh, against the deal of the century. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question. Um, so a few, pe few people have asked um, about, uh, for you, Rabbi Linda, when you've been in the West Bank, what have responses to you being there in regards to soldiers as well as Palestinians? And for you, Amy, how does your own faith community react um, to your uh, delegations to Palestine? It's really interesting. Um, being, being on the West Bank, um, and, and, and I've been there um, with Christ, Christian Peacemaker team, right? So uh, people don't assume that, um, uh, that I'm Jewish. And um, I uh, just usually don't say anything until we're in a, a room where it's clear that it's acceptable and then I talk about it and then it's, it's fine and celebrated. Um, I, um, I had one very weird experience where we were walking um, through um, 
we, we had gone out in the in the afternoon to walk along a, a road that um, is walked on on Friday afternoons, both by Muslims who are coming back from their mosque and by Jews who are going to their synagogue. And we were walking along to make sure that everything was peaceful and everything was okay. And when we were on our way home, we reached a, um, a, a checkpoint where um, I had heard in advance that one of the soldiers tended to ask everybody if anybody with them was Jewish. Because if anybody with them was Jewish, they would pull them out and they would say, no, you're not gonna be safe here. And they would take them up to the settlement, to Kiryat Arba, and they would walk them around the settlement because they said, oh, you can have protection there. But down in the Muslim area where you're walking, you won't have any protection. So I had kind of forgotten about this until we were walking back past this, this um, soldier who called out to us and said, um, uh, are you, uh, you know who who are you and we said we we were just taking a walk um, and we were going back to the old city in Hebron where we were staying and she said um, are you all Christian and she said it to me and I looked at her and I said yes we are and she said oh okay go ahead and we kept on walking and I realized that it was the first time in my entire life I had ever denied being Jewish and that it took going to the land that supposedly is holy to my people to push me to a place where I felt safer denying my Jewishness than claiming my Jewishness. Mm. And um, it was actually very, a painful moment. Mm. Um, and and made me realize um, how easy it is to, um, to feel deeply, deeply insecure and um, to feel deeply um, uh, unable to stand up and claim who I was um, at a place where I could feel so deep, so vulnerable. Um, it was quite a moment because Palestinians on the West Bank, once they learned, got to know me a little and learned that I was Jewish, were warm and supportive and friendly and thrilled that I was there. Uh, the question about how do my congregations uh, view my delegations, um, the one that I've served in Philly and now in uh, the western suburbs of Philly, uh, they all understand that uh, if if uh, they want me to uh, be a passionate pastor and deeply engaged uh, with them and the world, that Palestine, this Palestine delegation, um, is uh, is is a deal breaker for me. Like I I have to be able to do this every year. Um, so, and I think that that's worked out well. Um, I, it, it feeds my, it feeds my passion for the work in Palestine and also keeps me engaged with what's happening, um, on justice issues on the ground, um, uh, in, in the community that I'm serving too, because I have, I come back with the CPT mindset, like, um, you know, where, where do we, where do we Christians need to stand? Who do we need to stand between? Um, who needs um, who needs uh, an ally? Uh, who whose voices need to be elevated? Um, and that's been a helpful framework for me. Thank you, Linda and Amy. Um, okay, I just want to say I'm sorry that we weren't able to get through all the questions that we had tonight. Um, but just to remind you that you can go to our website, cbt.org. And there's a contact form you can fill out, be sent straight to us, and we will forward any messages you have for Amy and Linda directly to them. Um, you can also find out about delegations there too, if this has piqued your interest and you feel interested in that, uh, please do navigate to that tab. And you can also donate to our work as well, so that'll be cbt.org slash donate. Okay, I'm gonna close this off now. Thank you all for joining us. I really hope that you found this informative, um, 
and yeah we look forward to potentially having you on your delegation in the future so thanks everyone thanks thank you